Welcome and thanks for joining us on this podcast for Global Health Insights at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. I'm Pauline Chu in Media Relations. We have fascinating new research to tell you about that's a state-by-state -state analysis of how each state in the United States fared during the first two years of COVID and what the driving forces were. The paper is now published in The Lancet. Our research team is with us to talk about this. Dr. Joe Dealman is corresponding author and associate professor of health metric sciences at IHME. Emma Castro is co-lead author and researcher at IHME, as well as a doctoral student. And Tom Boyke joins us as well. He's co-lead author and director of the Council on Foreign Relations Global Health Program. So thank you, all three of you, for joining us for this discussion. Joe, let me start with you. There are so many layers to this research and so many themes to think about. What would you like somebody to walk away with in terms of the key takeaways? Yeah, thanks, Pauline. Thanks for asking. Uh, you know, this is this is a big paper. It was uh, a long time in the making, and we have a really great research team that we got to work with on it. Uh, and it has a lot of kind of key pieces. But where we really started was just acknowledging the enormous variation across the 50 US states and, and Washington DC for that matter. This fact that the mortality rate in some states was three or four times as high as other states, which is really remarkable. Uh, it suggests that in those states with the highest mortality rates, if they could have somehow achieved the lower mortality rates of the highest achieving states, they could have seen 25% as many deaths as they saw. That, that's just a remarkable and really important characteristic. And so as a bunch of researchers, we felt like it was really important to not only uh, kind of report on those differences, but also try to kind of standardize and say, well, you know, are there some things that states just couldn't have done to achieve a better a lower mortality rate? And then to ask the question, really of, of everything that's left, what are the things that we can use to explain that tremendous variation? What, what are the factors that explain why uh, states like Maine and New Hampshire and Hawaii did so much better than, than other states, uh, in particular Arizona, Washington, DC, Texas. Uh, and, and these, and then that kind of led us down this track of trying to understand characteristics that influenced the pandemic that were established before the pandemic. Things like the kind of socioeconomic conditions within a state, the healthcare system. Uh, then we went on and kind of looked at the policy response. What were the mandates? What were the messages that were coming away from the, the governor of the state? Uh, and then finally, how did people respond? What were the vaccination rates like? What kind of mask use existed within the state? And then finally, the very last piece uh, was to ask the question of how did these behaviors and policies impact other things we care about? Uh, in particular, how do they impact the economy? How did they impact employment rate? Uh, and, and to some degree, was it detrimental that it did, did our policy response to the pandemic lead to worse economic outcomes, higher levels of unemployment, as well as uh, reductions in, in student learning, at which we quantified by looking at changing test scores over time. Uh, so again, very large paper, uh, looked at a lot of different things uh, and, and, and came to, I think, some really important conclusions. Yeah, these are excellent big questions. And, and Emma, the research revolved around a concept of the syndemic framework. Can you explain to us lay people what that is yeah. and how to, how to think about this when, when we're thinking of some of those big questions that Joe just uh, posed? Yeah, so that term comes from uh, two words, synergistic epidemic. And it's just a framework that helps to draw attention to some of these upstream contextual factors um, that can play a role in how diseases tend to cluster uh, among populations that are more vulnerable. And I think um, one example that uh, I like to point to that helps to help people understand why that framework is useful. So one of our key findings is that states that had higher rates of poverty 
um, tended to have worse outcomes. And we also see uh, examining the issue of race, we see states that have um, higher rates of individuals identifying as either Hispanic, Black, or Native American. Those states also tended to have higher infection rates. But let's remember, there's no biological reason why someone of a certain race or ethnicity should be more at risk of being infected. Those reasons are entirely structural. And so the syndemic framework can help us look for the upstream social, economic, and political uh, factors that, that are uh, causing uh, COVID to disproportionately impact certain communities, particularly communities of color. And I mentioned at the beginning that, uh, that notion that we found that poverty was associated with worse outcomes as well as um, interpersonal trust and access to quality healthcare. So you can see, you know, we can start to unpack some of those uh, conditions, the characteristics of a state and see why that might be related. Um, regarding poverty, someone who's living in poverty uh, is more vulnerable to the, the disease in that they're less likely, they're less able to uh, socially distance. Perhaps they're reliant on public transportation rather than owning a car. Um, perhaps the job where they're employed um, is considered essential work and they weren't able to work remotely during the pandemic or um, perhaps uh, paid leave, sick leave isn't an option and uh, unpaid leave is not an economic reality. And so you can see how there's all of these contextual factors that make a huge difference in terms of someone's risk of being infected. And it's really important as we're trying to explain that variation that Joe is telling us about that we consider all of that, not just the biological factors, like for example, uh, population density. Uh, there's many, many other um, contextual factors that we need to be considering. Tom, let's talk about race because that's a factor that you looked at in this research. And you discovered that the states that performed the worst had larger black and Hispanic communities. Can you tease out why there was this disparity and how it might be different from our previous discussions about racial disparities in terms of access? So the difference for the racial or the reasons for the racial disparities in this pandemic differ. Um, let's start first with uh, the result that ties to states with a disproportionate number of people that identify as Black in the 2020 U.S. Census. Uh, what we find there is that most of these individuals do reside in the southeast, southeastern states. Um, and those uh, states, you still see for that population in particular that um, Black Americans are perishing at a rate from COVID-19 at a rate about 1.6 times as frequently as whites. Um, this seems to be tied to historical inequities. Um, in particular, in those states, uh, you see a cluster of socioeconomic uh, characteristics that seem common to those states, in particular, high rates of poverty, uh, lower access or less access, rather, to quality health care, uh, uh, lower rates of um, interpersonal uh, trust, and those factors seem to, to really combine to drive um, the, the disparities we see in terms of people getting vaccinated or their ability to get the treatment and the care that they require. So if we push this forward into what policymakers can do and they look at these racial inequities in preparation of the next pandemic, what would some uh, policy recommendations be? So uh, for, for the states where you have these historic inequities, um, socioeconomic inequities, uh, it, it, these are not, this is not new. So to answer your question from before, uh, these inequities uh, exist across a number of challenges from maternal mortality to HIV death rates also tend to cluster in the same states uh, that are in the Southeast and disproportionately have, or have disproportionately large populations that identify as Black. 
uh, progress really depends on addressing uh, those inequities. Um, and it is past time as a society that we, that we do that. Um, there are other strategies we can employ in terms of having community specific programs that can make it easier people, for people to get vaccinated in a crisis, make it easier for people to uh, obtain the treatment, to have a dialogue between affected populations of policymakers, uh, but it really is on that level. On the Hispanic side, to be clear there, we're largely talking about southwestern states, states like New Mexico, Nevada, uh, Arizona, and there it seems largely driven by a, a different set of factors, largely around high rates of uninsured. So those are states that don't have the same levels of socioeconomic inequities overall that you do in, in the Southeast, uh, but there's still barriers to people getting access to care. And while a lot of things were provided by the federal government uh, at low cost or free during this pandemic, vaccine, tests, mass, that's generally not true for treatment and generally not true for the care that people received in hospitals. And that still remained a barrier for populations. And that seems to have played a role in why we see outsized poor results for Hispanic populations in this pandemic. So as we start to think about these factors and the structural reasons, um, Emma, let's just stay with you for this. Mm -hmm. Can you help us understand why a state like Hawaii, New Hampshire, uh, fared better than uh, Georgia, for example, and Nevada? Well, so um, those are states that exhibit um, differences in those key traits that I identified. So the top performers tended to have lower rates of poverty, higher uh, general educational attainment, uh, higher rates of interpersonal trust, and better access to quality care. And the converse uh, is true for the states that struggled in the pandemic. Those were really the main, the four main factors that we saw mattered. Uh, Joe, let's um, talk about some of the trade-offs that you saw in education and economic trade-offs. Some of them might be surprising uh, when you look at the mandates. Can you talk a little bit about what you found and what was particularly interesting to you? So, Again, we kind of looked at three different pieces here. One was general economic productivity, so the kind of the production levels within the state. Then we also looked at employment rates, and then we looked at changes in student test scores in, in fourth and eighth grade. Um, and, you know, starting with kind of general uh, kind of health of the economy and, and ability for a state to be producing, what we found is that there, you know, most, if not all, states really struggled during the pandemic. Uh, that goes without saying. The economy uh, was was in dire straits, especially in 2020, with some obvious rebound in 2021. What we found that was really important and interesting is that there was really no relationship between economic productivity and how a state did relative maybe to their neighbor um, and the amount of policy mandates that they put in place or the behavior of the people that were living in the state. Uh, so to be to be really clear, the states that uh, maybe had longer lockdowns or had schools closed for a longer period, had mask mandates, uh, those st states didn't do any worse than the states that maybe had less of the kind of policy response, maybe uh, fewer restrictions for the people living in the state. So that's kind of the first point. And, and I think really important and surprises some people uh, because it does speak to kind of thinking about the next pandemic and, and what kind of policies we might be able to put in place and really and ultimately how robust the, the uh, US economy is in general. The second point was employment. Uh, and here we did see more of a reaction. Uh, we saw that the states that did put in place more policy mandates, more restrictions, uh, related to masking, um, closing restaurants, for example, those are states where there was a larger reduction in employment. Uh, and consequently, we saw that in some ways there's kind of a trade-off. The states that had the lowest infection rates for COVID-19 are the states that had the lowest reductions in employment. And so, you know, uh, again, I, from a policy perspective, there is to some degree a choice of asking, do we want policies in place that we know 
can restrict the, the transmission of this disease, uh, but at the expense of potentially leading to more unemployment. Uh, and again, I think thinking for the next pandemic, that really poses the question of, in a pandemic, what can we do to protect the unemployed? What are the systems that we can put in place uh, if we know that some of the policy response is going to lead to unemployment? What are the systems that we can put in place to care for those uh, that may be losing their jobs in the midst of you know, a, a crisis, a health crisis? And then the last piece we looked at was education rates and, and, and changes in test scores for fourth and eighth graders. Uh, and here we found some relationship. It wasn't quite as rock solid as uh, looking at employment. Um, I think we believe there is a relationship, but it was weaker evidence and, and more variation. Remember, our analysis is at the state level, and there's so much variation within schools, within school districts, and within states uh, that it's hard to capture these things. In addition, you know, schools responded to school closures in very different ways. Uh, as far as what services are still available to students. We did find weak evidence that the states that uh, essentially had the lowest infection rates had slightly higher reductions in fourth grade math scores. Uh, and this is consistent with some of the other findings that, that researchers have pointed to. But again, I think as far as trade-offs are concerned, where we found evidence, it really was the story revolving around employment and infection rates. Uh, Tom, you also looked at political affiliation, and this was a very interesting observation in this research that the states that fared the worst were states that voted for the 2020 Republican presidential candidate. Why was it important to look at political affiliation? Because some people who read this may say, look, COVID doesn't care if you're male, female, if you're Black, Hispanic, or white, or if you're Republican or Democrat. So why was political affiliation important? So COVID definitely, or the virus, uh, does not care about the political affiliation of its victims. Um, it does respond to mitigation measures designed to slow the spread of the virus. Uh, it does respond to the availability of effective treatment. And these are policy choices, policy choices that that may differ by party. Um, that's certainly the perception. And um, there are some articulated differences uh, between, the, uh, between members of uh, those parties in terms of how they pursued this pandemic. So we looked into it. We looked into it both in terms of what was the political affiliation of the governor or a highest level executive uh, in that state or territory, as well as looking at what the vote share was. And we looked at it both ways, both for Democrats and for Republicans in terms of vote shares. Now, on the governor's side, we found no affiliation at all. Um, in fact, in terms of the top 10 performing states in this pandemic, they're evenly split between states that are led by Republicans, um, which include states like Nebraska and Ohio in the top 10, as well as states that are led by Democratic governors. Um, so an even split there. We see no affiliation overall. That said, for the states that voted most heavily for the 2020 uh, Republican presidential candidate, uh, you do see a difference. That difference seems to be driven by two things, um, or at least we've identified two pathways for it. Uh, one is by virtue of the fact that we saw less use of policy mandates like business closures or mass mandates or vaccine mandates in states that voted heavily for the 2020 uh, Republican candidate. And we do find that overall those mandates affected vaccination rates and particularly in the case of vaccine mandates infected death rates. Um, the second pathway by which it seems to have an effect is that the strength of your health system matters a lot in uh, states that voted heavily for the Democratic candidate in the 2020 election, in the sense that the stronger your health system, uh, the more health spending you have, the higher the vaccination rates you see in those blue or Democratic-leaning states. The opposite is true for Republican-leaning states, where it does not seem to have mattered, the strength of your health system did not necessarily lead to higher vaccination rates. And that's a pretty stark finding from this study. Tom, thank you so much for joining us with your insight. I know that you have to drop off from the podcast right now, uh, but I want to thank you and we'll continue the conversation with Emma and Joe. It was my great pleasure. Thanks for having me.
Emma, I wanted to tie in the some of these um, comparisons with the issue of trust. Um, you looked at community trust and um, government trust. How does it play into this and, and piggyback off of what Joe had talked about in terms of some of the trade-offs um, resulting from the mandates? Yeah, and you know that also comes back to your question about recommendations for the future. You know, in building trust, which is something that our paper tells us is is lacking and is something that's important in terms of um, protecting states against uh, worse COVID outcomes. Um, in building trust, it's important to be transparent about what policy measures work, which ones don't, and what the trade-offs are. And I think, you know, that's really the whole goal of our paper is to lay it all out there, the good and the bad, what worked, what didn't, and what are the compromises that states have to make if they want to take certain actions. And so we hope that um, by laying out all of this information, we can start to communicate that and, and build trust around um, this, you know, around pandemic preparedness and what what should what should we do in the future? One of the interesting uh, observations when it comes to education was the you found that that in certain states with higher infection rates, the test scores were better. Yeah. So how does that make sense? And how would a policymaker be able to take that and create a policy if this happens again? Well, so interestingly, we, you know, we thought we might find an association between primary school closures and test scores. Um, you know, you could imagine uh, why uh, if schools were closed for more time, the scores might suffer. You know, we didn't necessarily see that. And, and as Joe mentioned, part of that could be that there's so much nuance that's happening at the district level and our analysis was at the state level and perhaps that's why. Um, but based on what we've seen in the paper at the state level, we, um, the way that we've conceptualized our findings in terms of trade-offs with test scores is that, the states that were more cautious in terms of um, implementing more policies to protect um, their uh, citizens from being infected likely also has a population that is extra cautious when it comes to COVID. And so you might imagine that the parents living in these states perhaps kept their children in remote lear learning longer than maybe was even required at the state level. And so that could be one possible explanation why we're seeing this trade-off. Um, it's important to remember, as Joe said, that uh, there were negative impacts across all, like us. Uh, I guess I should say the scores suffered unanimously. We saw declines um, almost in every state. Uh, so I guess the question becomes, how do we minimize those declines? And you know, now that we're moving beyond the pandemic, how can we get back on track? And finally, well, uh, yes, Joe. Oh, I just want to add, you know, to what Emma had was saying about interpersonal trust and trust in governments. You know, this is uh, this is a topic we've explored with this pandemic previously, uh, and found that trust in governments, in particular, was one of the most important things internationally for uh, reducing, you know, adverse outcomes for COVID, so reducing mortality and, and reducing infection. So this this concept of how does trust have impacts on health and specifically COVID mortality has you know, been looked at a fair amount. And I think it's really important for people to understand that the amount of trust that people have in government officials, in uh, elected officials, uh, but also people in public health, as well as their neighbors, this is you know, interpersonal trust that we look at, those things change over time. Uh, and by and large, in the United States, which used to have some of the highest levels of trust, there's been a, a real reduction over the last you know, uh, three decades that uh, has, has led to much lower levels of trust. In a pandemic, levels of trust evolve relatively quickly. Uh, and this is where I think what Emma was saying about very clear uh, communication from public health officials and other elected officials is tremendously important. Uh, taking some of the ambiguity out of a very scary situation uh, 
uh, instead of contradicting each other, speaking with a, a single voice so that, again, it isn't a political issue, it isn't a socioeconomic issue, but people have the opportunity, they know um, what they're supposed to do and, and do their best to, to do that. And again, that's where I think the public health system really has a place to intervene and say, this is what needs to happen. And for those people that will have a harder time acting upon our recommendations, we need additional support. We need to intervene in different ways. So building that trust now and and building that communication now before the next pandemic is critical. I know you've uh, written about this in the paper. Um, Dr. Joe Dealman and Emma Crastro, thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. Thank you. Thanks so much.